Two relatively recent pieces of superhero media portrayed their villains with what seemed to me to be clear, if not intentional, autistic coding. Which one did it better, and what does it mean for portrayals of autism in media? A while back I did a video for Autism Acceptance Month. Hey look, there it is in the corner or the description or wherever links are right now, where I talked about my autism diagnosis and how it related to my schedule and my well-being. It went over shockingly well with many people glad to see representation in the YouTuber space as signified by the many I never news, the bane of most people on the spectrum with the ability to pass, or mask as we call it. We understand it's a positive signifier, but it's also a constant reminder that many people are woefully uneducated about the condition and are unaware of the impact ASD has had on our culture, both negative and positive. Maybe I can help with that. This is Introspectrum. A quick disclaimer off the bat, I am one autistic perspective, and that's like having one POC or gay or trans perspective. There are common threads and experiences between autistic folk, but we are all different. As with all minorities, even when we have many shared traits, when it comes to personality itself, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. What I say can only represent my own experiences, so keep that in mind. Also, autism isn't technically a spectrum, as it implies a line with very autistic and not autistic at each end, which is the wrong way to approach it. ASD has multiple traits which can be more or less prominent between each individual, so it's more like the stat wheels in Persona or a Pokemon. That being said, I'm keeping the name, because A, the word spectrum technically by definition means linear, but most people associate it with colours, which brings to mind a million different combinations, especially with the color wheels, so I think it's fine to fudge the meaning in my eyes. And B, did you see that title? I ain't given up that title. Would you give up that wordplay? All right, that's all, I swear. I just needed to clarify it or it'd be boring into my brain through the whole process. A common trait for those with ASD. Back to the topic at hand. I, as most did, watched The Batman a while back. It's good. I love most things about it. The cinematography, the acting, the fact that a movie about Batman actually delves into some of the bad aspects of Batman as a concept rather than just being Batagander all the way down. I even liked how grimdark it was, because it didn't seem ashamed of it, you know? Like the Nolan verse was all, Yeah, I'm dark, but I need to be dark. Let me explain to you why every single aspect of my lore is explainably dark. Which is fine, but the Batman series is more, Yeah, I'm a goblin who hasn't seen the sun in years. This is my aesthetic. I like it. It's fun. I also like the Riddler in it as well. I feel he wasn't as powerful as some of the other villains put to screen, but I fully admit that is stiff competition. I liked his clues, but I also liked how he's shown as pathetic rather than some super genius, and Batman is mainly just stumbling through the detective work because, wow, two years as a vigilante doesn't translate to a degree in criminal psychology, who'd a thug? Also, I know it's become a cliche lately for supervillains especially to be all, I have a disturbingly good motive, but whoops, I also murder. Don't think too hard about municipal corruption and radical efforts to stop it in this million dollar movie given text credits by the city of Liverpool, London, and Chicago, folks. And Riddler kind of falls into that, but I feel like he's shown to be self-serving enough. You can tell he's just using buzzwords to enact a revenge fantasy. Plus, it has the world's worst lit hospital room. So anyway, the movie's great, the Riddler's great, but then there's the scene. This is all in your head. You're sick. Twisted. You're gonna die oh, alone. No, 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 no! Oh, nobody! And I shrank into my seat. To be fair, most people did. It was probably the most polarizing scene in the movie. But while every other person I knew on the negative side was more cringing at the bold gamble to try and make Ridley Paul sound unhinged by bursting into song, which... What have you done? Oh, yeah, I get it. It reminded me of another infamous villain moment which had a similar reception. Revenge. On Umbrella. Honestly, if they just got him to keep it lower register, it would have gone down way smoother. But yeah, most people focused on that, but I focused on this. No! Now, as I said, this is my own perspective. I've talked with other autistic people who don't feel the same way, but to me, that really really sounded like a vocal stim. All right, since many of you out there are most likely cocking your heads like an adorable puppy, let me tangent for a moment with a lexicon thing. A major part of autism is living with the overload of emotion. I'll skim over a lot here because I'll hopefully go into more detail in future episodes, but the main thing I want to do right off the bat is dispel the myth that autistic people don't feel emotion. One of the first things doctors tell parents of autistic kids is that they need to be prepared for their child to never hug them or say I love you, and there's a whole other potential episode on how they need to stop treating it like a freaking disease and more about how the parents need to adjust their expectations and understand the ways their child does express those things. But anyway, because it can be put like that and visibly autistic people can seem very emotional 
emotionless and sullen, it seems like they don't feel emotions. Let me rip this off right now. They act that way because they feel too much. Emotions, textures, sounds, smells, it differs wildly from person to person, but the through line is we might act emotionless or stoic as a survival technique. In most instances, if you see an autistic person staring at the wall, what's going through their mind is not, but much more likely, Wow, that sounds horrible. What a terrible disability, you might ignorantly think. Uh, that sounds harsh, but I need to stress ignorance is a neutral term, not an insult. I'm ignorant of so many things, but I want to be better. It just means that there are elements that you aren't aware of in a situation. So I'm here to tell you as a baseline. If you think autism is a horrendous mental disease or an enviable superpower the population needs to worship, you're ignorant. But hey, it's an easy fix. Educate yourself! Autism is a disability due to how society doesn't cater to it to the detriment of autistic individuals. Which additionally is why you should never say differently abled because because it implies that the way we treat them shouldn't be addressed. But it is not a disease, and it's not a superpower. It's a neurotype. It's just a way the brain can work, not lesser or more. If someone's left-handed, you don't say, oh, they have the superpower of pitching a ball differently. South pour away. Or, dang, they need to pay for a custom baseball mitt. What a horrendous disease. I mean, they used to. That's where the word sinister came from. Look it up. But definitely not anymore. Now you know that that's just a type of brain. It has perks and shortcomings, but it's just a product of biodiversity. Autism, likewise, is just a type of brain. Sorry, sorry, I know I'm in a tangent within a tangent, but you know, it's the first episode, so a lot of bases need lining. So yeah, autistic folk feel a lot, and it can be wonderful and so amazingly fun, but when it's a little too much, we often act emotionless because we're just flippin' concentrating. Next time you feel a cough coming on, try to hold it back as long as you can. Yeah, not so expressive now, are you? Except for us, we can't cough, so that uncomfortable feeling builds and builds and builds until one of two things happen. You have a meltdown, not pleasant, or you stim. Stimming can be a myriad of different things, from rocking to tapping, to flapping, which is one of the most visible ones. It's a small distraction for the body that releases the overloaded feeling a bit so that it's easier to concentrate. It's like when you're under a sheet and you lift it up and let go. The pressure comes back slowly, but it's still gone for a bit. Now, as well as that, there is also vocal stimming. It can look and sound similar to Tourette's syndrome, where an autistic person can repeat phrases or sounds as a potent stim. The difference is that Tourette's is a tick, completely involuntary, whereas vocal stimming is subconscious, a half-noticed motion almost exactly like scratching an itch. Stims, both vocal and otherwise, are usually used when those on the spectrum are feeling an excess of emotion, which can be caused by stress but also by happiness or contentedness, it's any kind of strong emotion. And they can take the form of moans or even nonsense phrases, like mine, which is usually 735. I didn't choose it. Depending on where your brain puts you, this could be as small as a mumble or as loud as... Well, yeah, that. Now, I understand that on the outset, this was most likely just a misguided acting choice. Most people groan when they find out things don't go their way and Ridley just found out a doozy of a bad revelation. But, and once again, this is just my perspective, when Paul Dano was asked to be as creepy as possible and he got to the point where he had to express frustration, he didn't choose Arr! or Arr! or Arr! he chose Now, I don't blame Paul Dano in the slightest here. I don't think he's a bad actor or a bad person. I loved 80% of his portrayal. I don't even think acting autistic even crossed his mind. But what did cross his mind? What was his direction? Creepy, unnerving, immature, mentally unwell. So, did he just make up a cadence and demeanor out of whole cloth? No, he drew on what he was raised to believe were signifiers of those things. Now, no judgment. What is the first thing you think of when you think scary mental asylum? Hands at weird angles, rocking back and forth, and, well... That noise. And why that noise? Because it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you think, what's going on in there? And you're worried that it'll lead to danger because even though old insane asylums should be scary because of how the people there were treated, instead we've become more frightened of the inmates. It's kind of a nasty side effect of Batman comics in particular that the perception of mentally disabled people is one of discomfort at best and fear at worst. It feeds into the idea not only that mentally disabled people are prone to violence, when the overwhelmingly vast majority are far more likely to be recipients of violence themselves because they're just so freaking scared. But that you need to be mentally unwell to commit 
commit violence. People see a mass shooter and think, boy, something must be wrong in their head. And instead of wondering what circumstances turn their head wrong, they assume that it's an anomaly, a genetic defect, a bad brain. And if they were just born with a good brain, there wouldn't be any mass shootings or violent crime or corruption or genocide because only someone with something wrong in their head would ever do that. Now, all we need to do is make sure everyone is born with the right brain. You get it? You get it. Now, I'm not saying Batman villains are cancelled. One of my favourite aspects of the Joker is that he's often explicitly stated to be completely neurotypical, or at least have no mental illnesses. It's just who he is, which is way more compelling. The Scarecrow is great because he confronts us with our own fears. Poison Ivy leads more anti-hero by the second. Harley Quinn teaches us about abusive relationships. Most of them wouldn't even qualify as mentally unwell. It's just the fact that they're in an asylum slaps that label onto them. However, the issue still bubbles up, and I hope future comics and films address it more as we move forward. Uh, but yeah, anyway, back to the Riddler. Now, hold on just a minute. You might be writing in the comments without submitting it until the episode is finished because you're a good citizen of YouTube. I feel like you're reading way too much into this. I don't think he was autistic. Most people don't even know what autism is or how it manifests. I might even be autistic myself, and honestly, I saw more traits in Batman. Okay, I feel you, Mr. Hypothetical, and I agree with you to an extent. I am reading a lot into it. Most people won't think the Riddler is autistic, and it was almost definitely not the intention of the filmmakers. But the audience is meant to find him creepy and gross and his actions use old visual shorthand to show creepy grossness that just happens to line up with autistic traits. So you watch this... Oh no, 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 And you go, oh, that's creepy. What a scary villain. I hope he doesn't sing next. But then you see a guy on the bus making the exact same motions and noises, and you might scoot back a little. But wait, doesn't that make me the moan police? Am I stifling expression? I mean, Jason wears a hockey mask, but I wouldn't get nervous around a goalie, though I would wonder why he's wearing it on the bus. He probably forgot his N95. But that's the big difference, and leads into a point I really want to drive home. Thank you for not commenting yet. Hockey masks also have positive representation. Jason wears one, but so do goalies. Mr. Texas Massacre uses a chainsaw, but so do lumberjacks. Dick Dastardly has a mustache, but so does Asterix. Many autistic and neurodiverse traits like stimming and moaning are overwhelmingly portrayed in media to elicit only two reactions. Disgust or pity. Either scary mental patients or inspiration porn, like the film Music, where the person with autism is merely a catalyst for the normal character's emotional journey. I learned how to be a better person. Yeah, but did they? Even the otherwise very well executed short film Loop from Pixar suffered from this. It was all about the neurotypical kid learning a lesson when the autistic character was just an obstacle. When's the last time you saw someone vocally stim in media and it wasn't portrayed as either uncomfortable to look at or dripping with bless their heart? Now, sharp-eared viewers may note I said many autistic traits, because to be fair, there's other traits of autism that are portrayed and framed as positive. The sexy traits. Yes, autistic characters have been getting more rep lately, I'm not going to deny that. There's obviously the good doctor, which I haven't seen so I won't comment on. Symmetra from Overwatch was confirmed to have ASD, and Chapter from she was similarly confirmed to be written that way, and Norma from Dead End is just wonderfully accurate and completely intentional even if they didn't have her say it. Huh? Will we be doing the original starter tour or the slightly revised starter tour 2.0, which includes the customer service simulator? Haha, <laughs> maybe you would like to lead the tour yourself. <gasps> Good morning, everyone. Which is weird, because they had Barney say, I'm trans. I'm trans, Norma. And everyone at school knows, and everyone at home knows. And being here, it's like a whole new place. I don't know why they couldn't get Norma to say I'm autistic, but, but still, otherwise fantastic. All of them are welcome, even the clumsy ones, because it's still representation, but it's only representation for a certain type of autistic. One that doesn't stim, and usually one that's, uh, it's a good way to put it, proven their worth? Again, Dead End is an exception, which is great, but for pretty much every other portrayal of non-passive, positive autistic characters, they usually have a superpower to make up for it, like a computational brain or a special interest that benefits the group. What if you're autistic but your special interest isn't in anything academic? We can't all be YouTubers lucky enough to get on the Patreon bandwagon early. <clears throat> Going back to the Batman though, that also brings up another element to the table. Even with the increased representation, heroic autism in media is still so very rare. So we take comfort in seeing ourselves in unintentional portrayals of it. Head canon, you might say. Just like how someone trans could see Aerith from Final Fantasy VII and go, she acts a lot like other trans girls I know. I'll just make it head canon that she's trans so that I can almost see someone like me in the game. Autistic people are absolutely no strangers to grabbing onto any kind of autistic trait in a character and not letting go. Vash the stampede from Trigun is one example. He acts a lot like an extroverted person on the spectrum. He overshares, doesn't get social cues, keeps going even when everyone finds him annoying but has an extreme sense of empathy. And you find out pretty quick that he masks like an absolute champ. There's a reason I have a statue of him in my office. I saw pieces of myself in him. 
Other people might see autistic traits in the Batman as well. I can see it. Strong sense of justice, obsessive special interest, being extremely knowledgeable about esoteric stuff while missing obvious big picture clues. But what if Batman stimmed? What if he rocked back and forth while he was going over the clues in the Batcave? Because, and I know the reason, and if you're being honest with yourself, you know it too, because people would find it unsettling. They'd laugh at it in the same way they laughed at the Riddler. Because there's nearly zero precedent for positive representation of stimming in an active character. There is the Ben Affleck movie, The Accountant, but that's another video. Put a pin in that one. The really funny thing is, you can portray unsexy autistic traits in villains without it being a negative stereotype. Let that sink in for a second. Yeah, I'm not against autistic villains at all. We can be jerks. We can be cruel, conniving, and selfish. Like all minorities, we are human beings, and human beings have the capacity for evil. I've seen cases of people excusing spousal abuse and infidelity by blaming it on their autism. I don't get social cues. That's why I groped you. That kind of garbage. Autistic villains, just like gay villains, trans villains, and villains of color, or BIFOC, are all possible to do right. The weirdest part about the concept of autistic villainy in particular is that it's already been done in a very popular popular show, also about gritty superheroes. Daredevil Season 1, or as everyone who's seen it calls it, The Kingpin Show, with this other guy, he's cool I guess, is pretty darn good if a little rough, until Wilson Fisk shows up and runs away with the whole thing. I actually can't think of a colder take on the show than that, pretty much everyone agrees. He's also heavily coded as autistic. I don't like to be in public. And I don't like to be questioned. Now, Coded can imply intention, so let me be clear. Just like Batman, I don't think either the showrunners nor Vincent D'Onofrio made a conscious decision to portray the Kingpin as autistic. But the way he moves, acts, and talks is so staggeringly accurate to someone on the spectrum, it was just impossible for me not to see it. Can tip the balance between life and death. Yeah? I wear them every day to remember him. Time and distance, therefore, a certain clarity. I believe we have opportunities, no? It's... Wilson. I apologize for the hard sell. His awkward motions, his next level discomfort in social situations, whether in public or clandestine villain talks, his love of order and schedules, his ability to exude a different energy on command, even his lack of eye contact except when mandatory, and his shy, stilted talking patterns just hit me like a truck. Perhaps you should have told me the importance of your cargo before you lost it. Yes, I was actually wondering if you cared to join me for dinner. I'm the only one working here tonight. That's okay. Another time, then. Mm -hmm. Yet, and this is the vitally important part that I'm shocked that they nailed it, let alone most likely by accident, his autism isn't what makes him scary. His villainous actions filter through his autism, but you know for a certainty that it is not the source. Why? Because when his autism is on full display, that's when he's the most sympathetic. My options, they were limited by necessity. I took no pleasure in her passing. And when he suppresses it, that's when he's the most frightening. I'm gonna kill you. Take your shot. Even for a viewer unaware of the traits of ASD, they see his clear awkwardness in social situations and admire that he's able to overcome that awkwardness while feeling bad that he even has to do so, even if it is all in service of doing something wrong. They see that he believes in what he does so much he's willing to fight through anything that stands in his way, even his own discomfort. When he's at his most vulnerable and sympathetic, talking to the woman he loves who sees him not for his awkwardness but for his character, you see even more attributes of autism, positive ones, geeking out about your interests to the point of self-awareness, finding someone with whom you you can let the mask slip and finally being comfortable enough to confide your insecurities to allow that intimacy. I didn't do it for her. I did it for me. That's why I still wear these. To remind myself that I'm not cruel for the sake of cruelty. That I'm not my father. That I'm not a monster. Am I? You can tell, through acting alone, that even though he presents so standoffish, he just feels everything so much. And sometimes, despite all efforts, the pressure just builds until it shatters you wide open. Get out. He is doing horrible things for horrible reasons. 
but his autism rounds out his character. It doesn't define it. It's amazing. And though D'Onofrio has never confirmed a diagnosis, the fact that in an interview he stated that he didn't understand the social politics of Hollywood and states that he was a shy boy who, quote, spent a lot of time in my room staying in my head, end quote, kind of made me do the SpongeBob face, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe he's not autistic, but by golly, he gets it. So, what's the issue then? I have a good portrayal to match the bad portrayal? Shouldn't whether they're good or bad guys be irrelevant? The problem is, like I mentioned before, not just balance, but exposure. When all examples of unsexy autistic traits are portrayed as only done by bad people, it just makes it more and more risky to add another one, even when it's done amazingly like Daredevil. It wouldn't matter if Riddler was a clumsy portrayal if there were heroic characters who did the same thing. Look. I get that the good intention shows and movies want to portray the positive aspects so people aren't so scared of it. That's a noble goal. But again, that's not for the benefit of autistic people watching. It's for the neurotypical viewers. If a show wants us to see ourselves in the media, we need to see the less sexy traits portrayed too, in a way that doesn't make us feel like we're only welcome if we don't make the characters uncomfortable or simply exist to make neurotypical people re-examine their biases. Show us as we are so we can see that we aren't always scaring people when we stim, that we don't have to hurt ourselves by mashing everything down in public to help society feel better about how little they're doing to accommodate us, so we don't have to feel broken, because how can we be broken? Miss Marvel stims too. At least, I can pretend she does. He claims we're sick, violent, demented. He says our disease will kill us in the end. Well, I don't believe it. Thanks for indulging.